Um, well, hello, everyone. Uh, Craig promised more awesomeness, so here we are <laughs> to deliver it. My name is Sarah Ellison, and I'm a media reporter with The Washington Post. We are going to talk about political correctness, and I want to put that in, um, in quotes because we're going to talk about what the phrase means. Um, it means different things to different people, how the concept has been used in our public discourse, and the relationship with free speech. I'd like to introduce my panelists. Um, in the middle is Melina Abdullah, who is the um, co-founder of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, which I just learned was actually the first Black Lives Matter chapter, the only one. Um, and she's a professor and chair of Pan-African Studies at California State University. Um, Hari Kondabolu, the comedian creator of the documentary The Problem with Apu. And finally, Dylan Marin a digital creator whose most recent project is a podcast called Conversations with People Who Hate Me. <laughs> That's not what this is going to be, yeah. so <laughs> just um, it's great to have you all here. Um, I'm really pleased. Um, before we get started, I want to remind everyone, uh, the audience here and around the world, um, people who are tuning in, that they can tweet questions for Patrice Hari and Dylan using the hashtag free to state, and I will pose them um, They'll show up here, and I'll pose them to our guests later in the conversation. Um, so political correctness, um, I want to start with you, Dylan. What does, it, what does it mean to you? What does the phrase mean? What does the phrase political correctness mean? Well, as a child, I knew that whenever I corrected an inappropriate joke from my dad, he would always rag on me for being too politically correct. <laughs> and I did not know that this would launch into a bigger national conversation beyond uh, the Your kitchen. Your dinner table. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Um, so to me, political correctness is the determination to be more inclusive and to be more mindful of the potentially harmful things that we've maybe unknowingly done to marginalized people calling attention to representation in film, uh, lack of representation in film, uh, calling attention to offensive jokes. So political correctness to me, which I think has gotten an awful rap, you know, people think that political correctness is the reason for all wars ever throughout <laughs> history. Um, I disagree. Uh, but political correctness is yeah the the determination for the inclusion of marginalized people throughout culture and language um melina sure well um when we think about political correctness, it has this negative connotation, right? Um, and the way that your president um, was speaking about it. Your, um, your president. Your president <laughs> um, was speaking about it really kind of um, condemns people who are looking for media representations, looking for um, inclusion and power dynamics um, as problematic, right? And it kind of takes justice efforts, equity efforts, and it minimizes what we're actually doing, right? That's one approach to political correctness. At the same time, they are demanding a certain degree of political correctness from those of us who have less power than they do, right? So when we think about- What do you about, mean by that, actually, though? I mean, what, what are you talking about when you say that? So when we think about the birth of Black Lives Matter, and we, when we think about the current protest movements, there's this um, demand by those who already hold power and who are oppressing many of us who are people of color, who are women, who are queer folks, who are poor, right? They're demanding that we um, demand our rights and fairness and justice in particular ways. So they have their own political correct kind of mantra that they're offering. They're saying that we're wrong when we get on the freeway and make cars like slow down, mm -hmm. right? They're saying that we're wrong to yell. Even um, I'm thinking about the work that I do in Black Lives Matter and we work very closely with families of those who've been killed by police. They're even censoring the way that black people mourn and saying things like, you know, you have no right to yell, just vote someone else in. That's still a demand for political correctness, but in the wrong way, the absolute wrong way. So I think that we really need to think about the kind of hypocrisy of that um, and think about 
political correctness in its traditional sense, the one that they condemn is really quest for justice and equity. And so I, if I can paraphrase some of what you're saying, it's sort of, it's, it's silencing some speech, but from the people who they, that, that might Because they don't want to hear us, right? The people who have to yell, right? Um, what is it? A riot is the language of the unheard, right? We have a right to riot because you're not hearing us when we speak in the way that you dictated that we need to speak. Hurry. I mean, I, at this point, I don't think political correctness means anything. I mean, I, it, it's been used so many different ways, and if language is supposed to be able uh, to, to give us a sense of a feeling or an idea or, or create images in our heads, I don't know what political correctness does anymore. Right. It, it's it's used depending on your point of view. It, it's it's honestly, it, it ends up being a. It's not so much just the ideas behind it, but just the term itself ends up being a block to conversation. Mm -hmm. You say that, you're done, right? I mean. Uh, the, the British comedian Stuart Lee called political correctness a kind of institutionalized politeness, right. mm. which is one way to look at it, the idea of inclusivity, being a good neighbor, so forth. Um, it can also be seen simply as sensitivity, right? You're being too sensitive. If you t use the word sensitive when people are saying you're being too politically correct, you're being too sensitive. You're, you're, you're inferring most. These are, they're just words and ideas. Yeah. That's right. what that's that's what we talk in words and ideas. Right. <laughs> that's what language is. Oh, don't well, pay attention to me. I'm just speaking to you in a way for you to understand what I'm saying, but it doesn't mean anything. Or, but what about the idea if you say, well, you, you can't offend someone? Um, why can't you? Why can't you know? I have two little kids, and um, my five-year-old now says, you know, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Yeah. Um, what a, I mean. Okay, but what, what, why can't we offend people? What does that mean? What, what is that question? By the way, that, that facial response of the cringing wasn't to you, but it was for the cameras. Good, <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, I mean, offense, first of all, it, it depends on the person, right? Like I think sometimes sure. we talk about that's offensive. You know, well, to some people that's offensive. Like I get called very uh, inoffensive by the people who like me, who like my stand-up. I love you because you're not offensive. Well, there's a lot of older white people that walked out of my show, so I, I think I might be a little offensive, mm -hmm. right? Right. So you, you can't define what is and what is not offensive, but I think it, it, to me it's like, is this useful? Is, the, is what you're saying useful? It's not to say that because it's not useful you can't say it. You can say whatever you want, as long as there is no threat or a greater restriction of free speech or damage, right? If you yell fire in a crowded movie theater, isn't that the Supreme Court case? Then that's, right. our, that's where you restrict free speech. But legally, to me, it's like, it's all there, but is it gonna be useful? Are we gonna have a real conversation about this or is this just an act of power? Um, I wanna talk a little bit about um, your documentary, which is The Problem with Apu. And I don't know how many people here have seen it, or heard of it, but you call out The Simpsons for its racist Indian stereo stereotype in the character of Apu. Um, a convenience store owner, no less. Um, some critics fault you for taking issue with a character that came to being in the, in the 80s. I mean, I wanted to say something earlier, but I was eight when it came out. <laughs> <laughs> um, talk about how that, that representation um, has, how representations change and sure. and why it's okay to, to, I mean, of course you can call it out now even though it was created in the 80s, right. but I mean, just talk a little bit about how you came to that and what made you want to make the documentary. Sure, uh, I used to be on a TV show called Totally Biased, it was W. Kamau Bell, it was on the FX network and Kamau used to let his correspondents uh, and his writers uh, share their own points of view, right? He wanted us to tell our authentic stories. So Mindy Kaling was getting a new show, which was the Mindy Project. So I wanted to do a show about the history of South Asian representation, since this was clearly a big moment because it was a South Asian woman having her own show. So when I was going over it, certainly Apu being the only representation that existed regularly for South Asians for at least a decade uh, mm. in the US growing up, it was weird to be defined by a cartoon character voiced by a white guy. Mm. Um, and using a crappy Indian accent. Um, and so I decided to put that in, but to be honest, I felt it was a little, like, why do I need to talk about this? Everybody thinks about this stuff already. Right. I don't see the issue. And Kamau had to remind me that, no, you and your community have discussed this to death. For most Americans, they don't see any issue with this. It's right. just a cartoon or it's, ju it's just television. Why do, you, why do you care? And as an artist who actually values what is being put out into the world, and sees uh, words as having impact, because then why else are we using them? 
uh, you know, I, we, I, we decided, I decided to talk about that, and it was something that has been used in college classrooms and uh, as, as, as a teaching tool, so it felt like a documentary to explore it a little bit more thoughtfully was, was necessary um, and lucrative. Oh, that's the most, that's the most important <laughs> Not thing. Not nearly enough. Um, I'm, uh, I'm still amazed. I, I will reference my kids again, but the, um, there are these Disney shows where like live action shows where the Indian character is always good at math. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, really? Yeah. This, is, this was made in 2017, like last year. I can't believe that that's still happening. And I, you know, so this wasn't just something that was, I mean, the 80s, yes, that character was, was beyond what would be created today. But there's still these sort of, I mean, it's a compliment to be really good at math, so that shouldn't be offensive. I mean, it's cool that we're that people of color and other marginalized groups are being given scraps by the power structure, but the main thing is to, for the power structure to change itself. Like, the reason why that car character exists is chances are it wasn't a diverse writer's room or a creator that made it, right? Mm -hmm. How many times do you see an Indian character and their name is Raj? Like, apparently everybody only knows an a Indian person Three named Raj, Indian. right? right. <laughs> it's not written by a South, or use the last name Patel or something, because that's the one you know. Right. So, I mean, characters, you know, when they're not made authentically, they're going to echo what the mainstream, which is coded language for white people, like, mm -hmm. in, in, in America, uh, thinks, right? And that's where money is going to, right? That's what, ca uh, you know, if, if you are a network, if you are creating a movie, whatever it is, that's your consumer base, historically. Mm -hmm. It's changing now because everything has been so spread out. Mm -hmm. So when, let's say, people of color and women and members of the LGBTQ community get a choice now to say something, it isn't because of political correctness. It isn't because of a sense of diversity and fairness. It's that people with money realize that if we let this person have a show, there's a bunch of other people that will we'll give money. For it. I right. didn't know their community had money. Well, I want their money, too. Right, right. Um, Dylan, you, you know, in this question of um, free speech, um, and you know, that's sort of what the, the whole event is about, but you've embraced the idea of engaging with people who are offensive, um, or I don't know. Well, the only or who hate you, or yeah, who are well, insulting you in right. some way. Why, why do that? Why, why is that valuable? So, um, the way I think of my podcast is I think of it as the asterisk on the First Amendment. You are free to say whatever you want. Uh, I am going to ask you why you said it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I try and focus on in my show. I really want to be clear that my show is not a debate show. If someone calls me a faggot, we're not going to debate about uh, how much of a faggot I am. <laughs> um, we're also, because <laughs> it's high. Um, <laughs> we are also not going to necessarily um, uh, debate about whether or not being gay is a sin. What I am very interested in is asking why someone thinks a certain way. And that's something that I don't see a ton happening in discourse, and I want to share something interesting, which is that a lot of times when I ask my guests to come on the show, if they accept, they often say, yes, I can't wait to debate you. And I stop them right there and I say, no, 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 this is not a debate. But it is interesting that the word debate is the closest approximation we have for having conversations across difference, right? And, and the reason I um, don't use debate on my show and, and don't love it is for two reasons. One, I think debate is gamified conversation. There is a winner and a loser at the end of it. And I think some issues are so complex that we cannot have a simple winner and loser at the end of a conversation. And the other, and I don't mean to be bleak here, um, but we are living in a very dangerous post-fact world. And what I mean by that is if we are, now of course there are facts, right? They exist. I hope but so. there isn't. Or else a, we're really in the yes, wrong business. But yeah, no, there are facts. But we live in a time when if I feel a certain way and my guest feels a certain way and it's the opposite, mm -hmm. I can go online and vet everything I'm saying with a whole bunch of sources that I deem to be reputable. And they can do the same thing. And that's a very, very terrifying thing. I don't need to tell this room that that's a terrifying thing. But that's why I am trying to kind of um, interrupt the space 
by asking why someone thinks a certain way, because at least they are experts on themselves, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying debate isn't necessary. I'm not saying we don't need to have crusaders for truth and for fact. Um, I'm dealing with truth, but I'm dealing with personal truth. And that's how I see my podcast is attempting to disrupt the space so can of discourse. I ask you something, yeah. though? So I hear what you're saying, and we talked backstage mm -hmm. about kind of taking opposite approaches, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah. I absolutely won't engage with people who hate me. If you hate me, go hate me somewhere else, mm -hmm. right? Um, <laughs> I, I wonder why, because especially after this last presidential election, there was mm -hmm. a lot of conversation, especially towards us in the activist community who are most in the streets, mm -hmm. right? What are we going to do to win the people who voted for the current president over yeah. to our side, right? And there was conversation about that and how are we going to reach out to them? Mm. And my thing is I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. You are a white supremacist. You go over there and I'm over here. Mm. There is no, I don't want to reach out to you, mm. right? You, I know what you think of me and if you have your own personal coming to Jesus or Allah or whatever moment mm -hmm. and it changes you, good, go through that process, but mm. I don't want to be part of it. Mm. Why do you think it's important? I don't, I, I guess this is, this is me doing you, right? Yeah. Why, do you <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think it's important to dig when there are people, the people who hate you and for the reasons that they hate you, are so problematic for the world? Um, well, first, I, I kind of just want to start by saying that I completely affirm the work you do. And I don't think that, not that you're saying this, but I don't think that our work necessarily conflicts with each other. Right. I see activism as a mosaic, right? And I, am, I can only hope to be a tile in that mosaic. And everyone has a different way of doing their work. Um, I am, I don't necessarily see my work as changing people's minds. I also want to just be clear about the title. The reason the title exists that way is that often when you read a negative comment to you on the internet, no matter where it falls on the scale of negativity, it feels like hate. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, I don't think anyone who I spoke to would ever identify as a white supremacist. But and they also, are. But, well, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't want to speak I mean, for that. I mean, I'm just saying that there's a lot of white supremacists who don't identify as white supremacists, but their behavior is ab absolutely white supremacy, which makes them a white supremacist. So I don't need them to affirm it for me. I know, right? Right. Well, but yes, I, not to comment on my guests, but, but I, I do think that systems of white supremacy are upheld by people who don't know that they're upholding them. That I, I, I think is fair to say, again, not speaking for my guests. But um, in terms of this whole, uh, uh, we are, you know, everybody like, we should just be speaking to the people that disagree with us. We should be speaking to the people who hate us. We should be speaking to the people who oppose us. I also am very clear in my podcast that I don't see it, nor do I see what I'm doing as a prescription for activism, right? Um, I am not saying put down the protest sign and pick up the phone and the world will be a better place. Mm -hmm. I am only- Or hand him a Pepsi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. I was inspired by the Pepsi commercial and I just said, I'm Kendall. Um, no, I, <laughs> yeah. So I hand every one of my guests a Pepsi. Um, and, so I just see it as trying to showcase what conversations can look like across difference. I do not demand that anyone else do it. Mm. Um, but I will say, uh, and this is not tooting my own horn. This is just to say, well, what's the point of it all, right? And the point of it all is when I get emails from people who are closeted and they say that just hearing the podcast has helped them find ways to talk to their parents, right? It has helped them start the process of having difficult conversations in their own life. This is just a, you know, um, 
my, the conversations I have, I'm not encouraging everyone to, to do the same, to reach out to people who wrote them negative things online. But in, in what other ways do you have like contentious conversations in your own life? You know, um, so I, I wouldn't ever say that my podcast or my approach is in any way meant to um, kind of one up other forms of activism. It is, it is just showing a way of communicating that I don't think exists in a huge way right now. Yeah. Selena, I want to follow on that. When you said um, that you wouldn't appear, I, I don't want to misquote you, but did you say that you wouldn't appear on stage with a member of law enforcement? Nope. I would not. You would not? No. And we actually have. Um, Why is that? So, just to be frank with you, you know, I believe in reimagining public safety. I believe that when we talk about how to build a world where we can all live and walk freely, for me, um, and I think for many others, um, that's an absence of police, right? Um, being someone who studied the origins of policing, especially in this country, and understanding that the roots of policing um, are in chattel slavery, and that they have been, the, the, the origins of policing are in patty rollers, right? And they've been trained to see me and other black people with targets on our backs. I don't think that, my goal is not to make kinder slave catchers, right? Um, what I'd rather do is spend time with people who are serious about engaging in radical imagination mm -hmm. and saying, what does freedom look like? Um, and building towards that. So I'd rather spend my time talking with folks like this and saying, well, um, the world could be freer if we had livable wage jobs for people, if we had housing for people, if we had mental health resources for people. We don't need people roaming through our streets with guns and badges and really seizing upon us, descending upon especially black, brown, and poor communities, um, and then having a goal of locking us up in cages. So I don't want to sit on a panel with law enforcement. I would, they can all get other jobs. I live for the day when that <laughs> is gone, and they can all be retrained for something else. I, mean, I see a value in, in the reaching out, not, not, so, not so much in, uh, with regards to, to police officers and the work you do, but I think for those of us who are either able to reach out, want to reach out, um, so much of like this recent wave of, of more formal white supremacy, different groups, comes from a sense of uh, alienation and loss and anger, uh, and, and, that, and the internet has always seemed to serve that purpose, regardless of what your politics are, to find other people. And so there are some people who are far gone. Like it's right. done. That's it's right. done. But there are there are people who are just, you know, they are just lost, and they want something. And this is the group they've chosen. And what group when you say this? Whether, whether it's the, what is it, the Proud Boys or Vanguard or all these different you know, groups that have, uh, it's, it's amazing that we get to, Nazis get different names, but for us, diversity doesn't matter. Okay. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> but like, you know, there, there's, if you are 18, 19, 20 years old and you go to that, you're different than a 44 year old with a job access and, and pushing forward. To me, I see a difference in, is there even a conversation that can be had? Right, also, we have to guard our own souls, sure. right? Like, so I don't wanna sit on a stage with someone or engage in conversation with someone when, you know, and this isn't to um, overstate it, but as a black woman and a black mother, yeah. right? Every single day is a trauma. There's a trauma every single day. Why am I going to, I don't need to um, thrill seek, right? There is, I don't need to engage in some kind of activist version of bungee jumping, right? Hmm. So I don't need to sit on a stage with a cop, with a white supremacist, yeah. with a um, you know, heterosexist, with a, I, I don't need to do that because there's other things that I can be doing. I loved what you said backstage, Hari, when we talked about comedy and you said it's mm. not therapy, it's therapeutic, right? Mm. 
um, that's how I feel about activism, right? I want to engage in activism and organizing in ways that are therapeutic and restorative to my soul because there's enough in the world that's depleting and that attacks us. Um, I'm watching this countdown and I'm so angry at the clock because I wanted to talk about microaggressions. I want to talk about hate speech. I feel like microaggressions are this thing that people, similarly to political correctness, they're like, oh, it's a microaggression. I feel like you guys might have something very interesting to say about that, but I'm going we to do. leave everyone wanting more. <laughs> um, and we'll continue the conversation backstage. Thank you all. That's all the, that's the only time we have and there's a, I don't, that's all I need to say. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank Come back you. next year for the next, next round. <laughs>